Today on the Ask Brady Show, we talk about trifold bulletins and why it's so hard to get rid of them. Well, hey there, Pro Church Nation, and welcome to the Ask Brady Show, episode number 27. We've got four great questions from the people of Pro Church Nation, and I'm joined, as always, to my left, your right, it is Roxanne. It's true. Behind the camera, the editing wizard himself, Joe Nex. And the man with the cam, Alex Mills. Thanks. It's not really as special as it sounds because I work here, but I'm here. Okay, Roxanne, take us away with the very first question. So the first question comes from Clayton, and he asks, what are your thoughts on using things like TweetDeck? Scheduled Facebook posts, the equivalent of for Instagram, wise, unwise, doesn't matter. Yeah, social media scheduling tools and management tools, analytics tools, super helpful. We use a ton of them. That's I true. think we've talked about this on the Ask Brady Show before. Uh, so we'll just give a quick rundown, though, of what we use. Uh, for our kind of general overarching social management, we use a tool called Sprout Social. It's probably the most expensive one that we use, and so it might not be best for most churches. I think it's $50 a month. I think so. I'm Something like sure. that. What's great about Sprout Social is that it congregates aggregates, collects all of the different messages, comments that are coming through all of your social media channels. So if someone likes, uh, sorry, if someone comments on a post on our Facebook page or messages our Facebook page, it gets sent there. If someone messages us via Twitter, it gets sent there. Does it work with Instagram? It does also work with Instagram. Um, for most things, private messages do not get sent there. So okay, but if the someone commented thing. on Instagram, it would yeah. be there too. Right, and so what happens is it gives you a stream. Think about like a news feed on social media, but it gives you the stream of all the things that are happening, but everything is coming from one of your channels. So it's like, you know, Clayton commented on a Facebook post here. And basically what it gives you is this like check mark that allows you to make sure that, okay, we've responded to this or mm -hmm. it doesn't warrant a response or whatever. Check mark, done. On to the next one. What we were having the problem with was people were sending in a ton of stuff through all these different channels and we were missing stuff. Yep. It's like, oh, did I check Facebook today? Okay, I got to check YouTube. Oh, did I check Twitter today? And we were like, we need something to bring this all together because we were missing support. We were missing questions from Pro Church Nation. It was bad. So... We use Sprout for our overarching everything collection. And then we also use particular individual tools for individual social platforms. So for Instagram, we use a tool called Grum, grum.co, and that allows us to schedule our Instagram posts uh, beforehand, which is great. Every Monday I come in, spend about 60 to 120 minutes putting together the week's worth of Instagram posts, all seven. Uh, we use uh, Buffer for Twitter video. We use mm -hmm. SmarterQ for Twitter as a whole. Uh, SmarterQ is a platform that allows you to put in a ton of posts and then it will continue to cycle those posts over and over. So I have close to 300 different posts in there for Twitter. And what it does is it posts three times a day. And then once it's gone through all 300, it starts again. And this is great because with Twitter, people are missing stuff all the time and the best stuff gets recycled. If I notice something is never performing well and it's been posted three times, I'll delete it. And what this allows me to do though is get the same message out again and again to new people, which is great. Uh, there is probably some duplicate crossover where someone is like, oh, I've seen this before, but it's probably still a helpful tip. I've talked about this on the Ask Brady Show before, the social media tools that we use, but maybe you didn't hear it the first time, or maybe you did hear it, but you forgot, and now you're hearing it a second time, and because you're hearing it a second time, it's sticking a little bit more, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Uh, we use... Am I missing any? I feel like I'm missing something. I feel like that's the major ones, but I do feel like we had other ones too. Do you use anything for YouTube? I've actually never... We've never talked about this before. We've used, we use all the native scheduling and publishing tools within YouTube. We used something called... Joe, do you remember it was called Vid something? Vid Hub? Vid Q. Vid Q. Was that it? The letter Q. Right, right. Oh. V-I-D, the letter Q. And what this did was it gave us like a suite of analytics on our YouTube stuff. So it was like... Here's how high you're ranking for this search term. Here's how relevant your video is. And so if you're looking for advanced an analytics for YouTube, we used VidQ for a while. Um, I love these third-party tools and third-party integrations. Uh, for Twitter, I use that natively. So like 
I don't have TweetDeck to view my tweets. I just use the native Twitter app. Right. Uh, but, you know, and then we also have a bunch of like, I'll use apps on my phone. So I've got uh, Vizco. I've got Layout by Instagram, Cut Story, Prime, uh, Rotate and Flip. That gets stuff ready for Instagram stories. Yep. Um, but that looks like pretty much it. So yeah, a variety of different social tools. I think third-party integrations are great. The only thing to add to the conversation would be that for some platforms, Facebook in particular, some people believe that if you use a third-party tool to publish to Facebook, Facebook will you know, hurt that organic reach for that post. Right. It's like it'll give a strike against that post and be like, you didn't upload and schedule natively through Facebook, so we're going to give you like a strike and we're still going to give this post organic reach, but not as much mm -hmm. if you had scheduled within the Facebook platform. Now, we always schedule within the Facebook platform unless there's a problem with the meta description, which has happened before, uh, but that's a completely a side bug thing, uh, not strategy-wise. We always schedule public uh, within the native Facebook app, uh, within the Facebook platform, like for web or mobile, um, because there's really no reason for us to schedule in another platform. We're already using so many different apps. Like it's not like there's just one third party app that we use. Yeah. And so that's the only thing to consider. We, we can't prove, I don't think anyway, that Facebook does penalize posts that are published or scheduled through a third party integration. But there are some people that believe that. So maybe just take that into consideration. Perfect. All right. Question two comes from Graham Arthur. And he asks, what tools do you recommend for internal communications in church? And how do you drive adoption slash create a process for them? Yeah, absolutely. So we use a ton of different, we're, we're just on like all the fun tools. And like, <laughs> no, those are always fun episodes. Everyone likes hearing about fun tools and stuff. So uh, our main tool for communication is uh, a tool called Slack. Yeah. And what Slack does is it allows us to never use email for digital communication. So this is our Slack app right here. And all of our communication happens within Slack. Now, there was a time when we integrated Slack for the first time, and it was a bit weird. And I think that's part of the question that uh, Graham is asking here, which is you begin using a, a new tool. How do you get everyone on board with it? Uh, do you remember when we first started using Slack? And like, I would say like, uh, Mitch would like text me. I'd be like, Mitch, don't text it to me. Slack it to me. Do you remember that? You guys were already kind of using Slack when I started. So it was a little before me. But definitely moving to the new office, we needed it a lot more than before because we were so close to each other. Before. Yes. Our first office was 400 square feet and there were six of us in there. Slack may have been a little bit redundant because <laughs> we were all like within arm's reach. Like yeah. if everyone was this close, that's what it would have been before. Which is funny because if Slack was integrated and installed within our culture before you got there, that means that we were using Slack with a team of three in a single <laughs> room. yeah. And probably because I would like, I have my headphones on. Do not talk to me. I'm working. You can slack me. <laughs> but now as a team of nine, like slack is imperative to our communication. So if you're a church of, you know, five, 10, 15, 20, like a hundred staff members, like slack would be just absolutely necessary. Uh, some tips when it comes to slack. Uh, we have a general thread that is just complete nonsense and chaos. Uh, and then we have kind of channels, uh, Wait, are they called channels or threads? It says threads here, but I thought they were called channels. I thought they were called channels they too. Called Maybe channels. they changed them. Okay, threads is a different thing. I don't know what threads are. Okay, channels. We're going back to channels. We have channels for Nucleus, Pro Video Announcements, Story Tape, coming soon. <laughs> And then we have also DMs for every single person. And so a lot of the times, like let's say we have, you know, a support issue comes up and maybe Alex wants to let me know about it. Alex will send me a DM through Slack. Uh, yeah. But maybe I want to talk about something publicly about Nucleus and I'll put that in the Nucleus thread. And we also have integrations with Slack. So Slack integrates with Intercom, which is our support channel for every product that we have on Pro Church Tools. So if you get support in Nucleus, in Pro Video Announcements, in Pro Church Academy, that support ticket gets sent directly to Slack. So we're notified. So we're not always in Slack, uh, in intercom being like, hey, do we have new support? Do we have new support? A notification gets sent to Slack and then we know to respond to it. And that way, unlike our social media tools where we have a, like a dozen different tools, everything is centralized within Slack. So that's yeah. how communication happens. Uh, let's see. We also use Trello a, a, a ton for our uh, for our project management. So if Slack is our communication, Trello is where our project management happens. Uh, every single week, we produce upwards of 150 video announcements for churches in the span of 48 hours. 150 videos being done by three people 
in 48 hours. Being organized is the key. It's or else true. people don't get their announcements. They get the wrong announcements. Everything's broken. We don't get them out on time. No good. Yep. So we have, um, the way Trello works is it's a project management app that works in columns. So imagine that each column is like the state of the project or that specific element of the project. So for instance, let's go through the way a video announcements uh, edition is produced and how we track it in Trello. Step one, it's like, just a church in the ready to go kind of stagnant waiting column. Then a church sends in a script. We prepare the script. We move it to the script prepared column. Then a host gets in the video studio and records it. It then goes into the recorded column. I just finished recording our 27 announcements today before we started recording Ask Brady. And every time I would film uh, an announcement, I would drag it over to the recorded column. We have a laptop that has Trello on it at all times in the studio where we record our studio videos. And every time I record a video, I drag it from the script prepared column to the recorded column. And then we know it's recorded. And then when someone begins editing those video announcements and they're done, they move it to the edited column. Final thing is to upload it and send it out to a church. When that's completed, it gets moved to the completed column. And that way you know at all times, okay, we've got 50 announcements recorded, 50 sent out, 50 have yet to be recorded, 50 are edited, and you know where everything is. Mm -hmm. Uh, We do the same thing with story tape, which I cannot reveal how or why we use that. It's a mystery project you will learn more about shortly. We're getting very close to revealing the details on that. Highly exciting. Uh, But we use Trello for our project management and Slack for our internal communications. Uh, The other probably final thing that would be important to mention is Evernote. Uh, Evernote is where all of our documentation is stored. It's where all of our like notes, uh, you know, if we're kind of collaborating, kind of like, it's not like the day-to-day of a project, the way the video announcements Trello board would be used, but it's kind of like big picture information, docs, that's where that's all stored. And then when it comes to our actual file storage, we use an actual server that all of our computers are connected to. So we set up a server. It has, you know, um, 10 gig or Thunderbolt connections. So everyone edits off the same server. So if Jonas is editing a, vi- uh, editing a video, I can then also just pick up where he's left off because we're both wired into the same server. Mm-hmm. So that has been really important as well. And that was one of the reasons that we wanted a bigger office because we needed faster internet. We needed a custom server set up from scratch. So that's kind of an inside look at how we do things here. Yep. All right. Question three comes from Magdalene and she says my church is 150 to 175 regular attendees what are your best tips for improving upon our church bulletin model without doing away with it completely but instead condensing it so we aren't printing so much every week um, or won't need someone to do so much editing every week we currently print a legal sheet of paper and tri-fold it with an insert and these are what we pass out to our attendees every service lots of it is repeated information like contact information or events coming up that don't make it to the sunday announcements what does change every week though is the order of service type stuff sermon titles worship leaders worship song lists etc does this ever become unnecessary how do we best transition to not having so much printed the trifold, the trifold bulletin, a classic, classic. so very classic. Uh, this is a conversation that I've had with many churches, Magdalene. Uh, you're not alone in this. Basically, churches are beginning to realize, hey, we're spending an exorbitant amount of money on bulletins. We asked and surveyed, you know, a couple hundred churches, and the average came out to between 15 cents and 20 cents per bulletin. So if you're a church of 100 or 150, and you're printing 100 and 150 bulletins mm-hmm. each week, that works out to like 200 bucks a month. Now, that math was made just as a guess. It could be wildly inaccurate, but I think it's close. (laughs) Let's do a quick check. Everyone who's smart with math is like, Brady, the answer is blah, and they already know. Okay, $30 per week, 52 weeks in a year, 12 months, $130. So $100 to $200, depending on the cost of your bulletin, depending on how many folds, color, or black and white, how many graphics, what type of printer, paper, and the quality of printing that you're doing. Point being is that's a big expense for a smaller church. Like one of the things that I rail against so much is like churches, you don't need an app. Your website is trash. Get a better website before you get an app. Why? Because if you're a church below 200, which the majority of churches are when it comes to size, $100 per month, which is what most church apps cost, is a huge expense when you already have a website. Stop being redundant. Do one channel well rather than doing multiple mediocre The same principle applies here with bulletins. Let's talk about another angle before I give you three tips on how to actually improve your bulletin and and get to where you want to be. And that is that 
Everyone resists change. Mm -hmm. It is hard to lose weight. It is hard to change your diet. It's hard to start a business. It's hard to start waking up early. It's hard to be a committed husband or wife. All of those things pale in comparison to the difficulty a church will experience (laughs) trying to remove a bulletin. You can get a six-pack, the best marriage ever. You're eating 100% vegan, non-GMO, gluten-free. You try to remove a bulletin, the church revolts. Mutiny, the pastor's thrown out. Everyone loses their salvation. I don't know what it is, but it is insane. People that are 60 and above cherish their bulletins almost as much, maybe more, than they cherish Christ. (laughs) Like, it is just insane. And that's a bit hyperbolic, but not much. What's interesting is that when we look at the demographics of our communities, they are increasingly getting younger. The point I'm making here is that the people that care about the bulletin are the 50 plus, the 60 plus people. And they are the ones that are also often giving the most. And so they wield a lot of power for better or for worse. I've seen churches try to remove the bulletin and this whole like, angry conflict of two sides breaks out and you're like, who cares? And because people wrap up uh, customs, formalities, and tradition into their own identity. This Mm -hmm. is something that we all do. We all take the things that are happening around us and latch our own identity onto them to make ourselves feel better and comfortable and feel safe and to tell a narrative that makes us be able to perform and get through life day after day. When someone takes that away, you're not just taking away a piece of paper that's trifolded. You're taking away a part of someone's identity because that's a part of the church, which is a part of them. You're actually taking parts of them away. It's like a horcrux. That's what it is. Harry Potter drop. Shouts to Harry Potter. All right. So with that being said, everyone who's 30 and under, 40 and under, We have no emotional attachment to bulletins. If I go to a church and they don't have a bulletin, I do not care. If I go to a church and they do have a bulletin, so what? If I go to a church and they remove the bulletin, I go, okay, this is indifference to me. So one in three American and Canadian workers is already a millennial. Add in Generation Z, by 2025, one in two will be a millennial. So increasingly, your churches will be filled with people who do not care about a bulletin. This transition is happening. And although the change is hard to navigate through now, the people that really care about it are just going to continue to get older and not to be crass, but to they will pass away. And this bulletin argument will disappear. It's only a matter of time. With that being said, you don't want to disrespect or hurt people's feelings. I think it's stupid that we care this much about a bulletin. I think it also kind of represents someone who's not very uh, secure in their self or mature in their relationship with Jesus. It's a bulletin. I know there are three folds to it, but still. Three for like the Trinity. Wow. (laughs) You're taking away the bulletin. Why don't you just take away the Trinity? Because that's the same thing that you're doing right now. (laughs) So let's talk about three things that you can do. The change that you can, there's two approaches that you can take. One, cold turkey. You take away the bulletin, you get a lot of backlash. People are upset. As long as your leadership is on board and there's solidarity, like a Band-Aid. Take it off. One smooth movement. It hurts but it's gone right away. The other option is to kind of gradually and slowly take things away. Practically, for many churches, this will be the more viable option. So let's talk about three things that you can do. One, you can print less frequently. If you're printing every single week, you could try printing every other week. You could try printing once a month. Think about it. If it costs $30 every single week to print bulletins, if you start printing 26 weeks of the year instead of 52 weeks of the year, you're saving $800. $800. You could put that into Facebook ads. You could put that into Snapchat filters. You could put that into buying a new guitar for the worship team. You could put that into a new baptismal tank because the other one is full of bacteria. Ew. Okay, that seems unlikely. I was running out of things that you could spend money on. <laughs> I don't know what you're just spending money on, apparently, uh, beyond communication, which they don't spend money on. Uh, oh. <laughs> got him. Uh, the second option is you could print less volume overall. So let's say, no, 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 we need to update the order of service each week. We need to have the songs, the hymns, the person that's leading worship, the topic of the message. Great. Instead of printing 150 or 100, look at how many are being taken each week and print almost that exact number. Make there be a little bit of scarcity when it comes uh, comes to the bulletin. We see this all the time. Bulletins in the trash. Bulletins left on a pew. Bulletins left on the lobby welcome desk because they were never taken or used in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, 
Think about how many you're being used. Maybe you only need to print 50 each week. Print 50 and then gauge how did that go. Do you need 55? Okay, print a couple more. What if there's still some that aren't taken? Okay, try 45 the next week. Try 40. And see how low that you can get that number. The people that really love the bulletin and are resisting this change, they're still happy. You're still saving money. Third option is to print less information. Instead Mm -hmm. of a trifold, you could go with a single card or a single kind of item where there's some stuff on the front, stuff on the back, but there's a lot less information. I imagine that this is probably going to be the least likely or beneficial option because for the people that really love the bulletin, they're going to see a revision or uh, like a removal of information as kind of an attack on the bulletin as much as if you got rid of it in the first place. So the reduction in volume or the reduction in frequency of printing is probably going to be better. But there, those are three ways, three different things that you can try, experiments that you can run to print less, save less money, and begin kind of weaning yourself off of the Mm -hmm. bulletin. Other option is cold turkey. I'm all for that too. Sometimes change needs to happen in a big way. And I'm all for like having big sweeping changes. It's kind of the way that I integrate change in my own life. You know, I'm kind of an all or nothing person. But when you're moving a, a community of people of 100, 150, which is a small church in comparison sometimes, but that's a lot of people. Yeah. Like we have trouble changing culture with nine of us at Pro Church Tools. To, to move 150 people, maybe slow and gradual change is better. Like sometimes I think about this as a big like cruise ship versus like a little canoe. It's easy for two people to turn a, uh, a canoe around and do a 180. To turn a whole cruise ship around, like that takes a long time. You can't do like a really sh- sharp 180 degree, degree turn. You got to like, change degree by degree. And it takes a while, but it's the safe way to make change and do a 180 degree turn. Right. All right. Last question comes from Jacob Martin. And he says, hey, Brady, how important has a gimbal been to your video work? If you were at a point of picking up some more glass or a gimbal, what would you recommend? Very interesting question. Jacob, we do not get too many questions about video, videography, cinematography. I would love more questions like that because it's uh, something that we do a ton here at Pro Church Tools and probably the thing that I'm most versed in when it comes to... Yeah, you love it. Like website, design, video, communications. Like video was my first love. It's true. And then I threw her to the curb. And then I said, wait, video. Let's Come be back. lovers again. <laughs> and video was like, fine, I am an inanimate object. I'm not even an object. I am an idea. I am a pursuit. I'm always here. Uh, okay, gimbal or glass. Glass is a cinematography kind of film industry term for lenses. And a gimbal is this device that you attach your camera to. And what it does is it stabilizes your camera and allows you to hold it. There's like these two handles, one on the left, one on the right, and your camera is stabilized in the middle. And what it allows you to do is move around with your camera and it just floats through the air without any shake or vibration. It's the kind of newest version iteration of the steady cam. If you've ever seen in a video or a movie, the camera kind of just floating through the air without any hindrance, this is a steady cam or a gimbal. If you've seen the movie, an Oscar award winning film, Birdman, that whole film was filmed entirely on a gimbal the entire time. It's one oh, gimbal shot I didn't know that. for 90 minutes or 120 minutes. Very ambitious and one of the reasons that it won. So that's what a gimbal is and that's what glass is. Now, when it comes to deciding what you want, this is actually for me a very tough decision because a gimbal for me is the most important tool when it comes to integrating motion into your videos. Uh, the first motion tool that I used Uh, that I bought when I was starting into the world of creating videos was a slider. Mm -hmm. And a slider is like a a, a track where you put your camera and then like you're able to slide it in a single direction. So it can go like, you know, the track's maybe three feet long, five feet long, and the camera is able to like move laterally or vertically, however you kind of orient the camera on the slider. Very simple movement, left or right, forwards or backwards, basically. A gimbal allows you to basically move the camera as you move as a human because you're holding it. And so you can move as far or as long as you want. It's not limited by a track. It's not limited by like a certain height. You can move it up, down, side, around. You can like change the camera, point it upwards, point it sideways, whatever you want. It is tremendously flexible and offers you so much when it comes to movement. With that being said, if you've only ever had one lens, getting another lens I think would be priority. I think 
one thing that I've been really experimenting with lately when it comes to creating videos is limiting myself when it comes to like the fun little tools and the fun little like uh, little like game pieces like ooh like y- you can use a gimbal as a crutch you can use a crane a slider as a crutch you can use these things and they can seem like you're making something good but you could be completely neglecting kind of the basics, the best practices, the right. order of operations of cinematography, of videography, because your camera's floating in the air, Roxanne. <laughs> this is something that I noticed happened to me when I first began using a gimbal. It was the coolest thing. I thought that I didn't need to focus on all the other things. So what I've been purposely doing is pulling back on the tools and the fun little things that I have with me and just going, okay, you have a camera, a tripod, and a series of lenses. And what this has really forced me to do is rediscover the importance of lenses. I think this is one of the things that I missed in a huge way when I first started creating videos. I kept trying to like worry about color grading or about using a slider or about like time lapses. The very first video technique that I explored in the very first video I ever made was tilt shift. It's like one of this advanced kind of like, it makes, it's a time lapse, but it blurs certain parts of the image to make it look like there's miniatures. If you've ever seen this, you might not know that the word tilt shift photography or tilt shift videography is the word used, but basically it makes a city look like miniatures. So often this will be shot like in a metropolitan area. There's people, there's cars, and it makes it look like there's toy cars and toy people. That was the first thing I ever did. All or nothing, uh, as always. That th- <laughs> very well. Very good, Roxanne. Very good. And so <laughs> what I've been trying to do is put restrictions on myself. They're manufactured restrictions. The gimbal's right in the closet. I could set it up. But like force myself to only use limited gear to really improve my skills as someone who's setting exposure, chasing light, framing shots, and also just improve the way I'm shooting handheld. Like I'm not even shooting with a shoulder mount. It's literally handheld and forcing myself, okay, if you're not gonna be able to create a good shot with motion and kind of use that as a crutch, if you've gotta stay still, you've gotta compensate for that in other ways, i.e. perfect lighting, great framing, good subject matter, narrative, storytelling, all of those things. And so I think I would go for glass first. Now, if I had to choose which glass to go for, It depends on the actual crop of your camera, whether it's full frame or you're working with a cropped sensor. Uh, To use the Ursa Mini Pro as an example, like most uh, cinema style cameras, it's a 35 mil, it's like a 1.6, 35 mil kind of crop. And so my go-to lenses on that are the 16 millimeter, which, you know, if it's 16 times times 1.6, what does that work out to? Like 24? Yeah, 26, which is kind of like a good wide angle lens. So a 16 mil like one wide angle lens, like 16 to 24, you're going to want one like portrait style lens, 35 to 50. And then you're going to have one more like telephoto 85 to 135. If you're working with a full frame camera, that's now 24, 50, 200, maybe, or 24, 85, 200. If it's like A Panasonic GH5 that's cropped a ton. Now you're at like a 12 to a 16, a 35, and an 85. You know, like the cameras that we're shooting on right now, they have a 3X crop through the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras. So we've got a 12 to 35 as the main and a 35 to 100 zoom as the second. So I would go with glass first, but then I would definitely go with a gimbal as soon as you can afterwards. Here are things that you can skip. A slider, a crane. You can skip... Hmm. A monopod is always helpful. A tripod is always helpful. Shoulder mount always helpful. They're also very inexpensive. Sliders are just a waste of money. Don't get a slider. Yeah, you've always hated ours. I remember you bought one after I started working here, and I don't think you used it once. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was because the the, the gimbal technology became affordable. You know, for the longest time, there was really this one gimbal called the Movi, and it was like 10 to 15K. And then, like, the Japanese manufacturers started getting on it. You found cheaper ones on eBay, and then American manufacturers started making cheaper ones, and then now you've got the Ronin, uh, the Ronin M or the Ronin Original, 1000 bucks, 2000 yeah. bucks. The cheapest one a couple of years ago was 3000 The cheapest one two years before that was 10000 the cheapest one before that was a steady cam. It was like 50K. You rented it, right? And so this technology is enabling filmmakers like us, videographers like us to do amazing things, but we can use that tech as a crutch. Don't go for the glass. Perfect. Awesome. Well, that does it for the 27th episode of the Ask Brady Show. If you want your question answered, maybe it's a question about video. Maybe you send your question in video. Oh. If you do that, you'll get your question prioritized and answered 
absolutely first in the queue. And send in your question. You can use Twitter or Instagram, hashtag Ask Brady, or in the comments below this video on Facebook or YouTube with the hashtag Ask Brady. Send it in via email. Hello at ProChurchTools.com. Thanks for watching. We love you, Pro Church Nation. Go seize the 167. We'll see you in another video, and we'll talk soon.